This happened almost 20 years ago, when I was in primary school. I went to a small public school near where I lived in the suburbs. Every year when the summer break was approaching, things got pretty relaxed. We didn't have exams, so marks were all taken care of, and things would wind down quite a bit. For the last week, there was barely any actual work being done. Every year during that week, the teachers would organize a scavenger hunt for the school. We would be in class for the morning, and then in the afternoon, we would do that. I was in 8th grade at the time, so I had done it many times before. Because of that, the fun had kind of worn off. Me and my friend Jamie saw it as childish, since we were about to head off to high school. Jamie and I went along with it for a while, but we were mostly just talking and hanging out. We were outside in the yard, with our teacher and the whole class. About half an hour in, Jamie nudged me and suggested that we break off from the group and explore the school. I thought that was a great idea, so we slipped away. The rest of our class went in one direction, then me and Jamie simply turned around and walked away. Nobody seemed to notice. Our school, a structure as old as the town itself, had always been the subject of wild rumors and tales. Stories of ghosts, hidden treasures, all kinds of stuff that kids make up. We didn't believe any of that, but exploring the school seemed like more fun than following some silly clues that our teacher made up. When we walked in the door, the halls were deserted. Everyone was out in the yard, so it was just us and the empty school. We knew we would have to stay away from the principal's office, because there would still be adults there, but there were no cameras, so we were pretty safe for the most part. We went into one of the classrooms and walked around for a minute, but honestly, it might have been even more boring than the scavenger hunt. That was when I remembered the school's basement. I had never been down there, but I knew where the door was. I had heard it was supposed to be just for storage, but it still seemed like the most interesting thing we could do. Jamie and I walked through the empty halls and eventually came to the door that led to the basement. Descending the creaky wooden stairs, the air grew cooler and it smelled musty. The basement was vast, much larger than we had imagined, with corridors branching off into the darkness. It was filled with old desks, broken chairs, and stacks of textbooks that probably hadn't been used in decades. A single bare bulb hung on a wire overhead, but it was quite bright, so we had no problem seeing. Like I said, the school was an old building, but the main level was all updated. The basement, however, probably hadn't been touched since it was built. The walls were made up of large stone bricks, and the floor seemed like concrete with a thick layer of dust and debris. We made our way into another area of the basement. Since there was just the one light bulb, it became harder to see. As we entered the next room, it was almost completely dark. Then out of nowhere, a light turned on. Jamie had found the light switch. It startled me, but then I looked over to him. He laughed at me for flinching, but then the expression on his face changed. He was scared. I turned around to see what he was looking at. In that room was a makeshift living area. A tattered mattress lay on the floor, surrounded by various personal items. There were a few cans of food and stacks of books. The room was a mess, and it smelled. Before we could decide what to do next, we heard a noise. A sharp creaking sound from the other room. Before we saw anything, Jamie and I turned around and ran back to the stairs. We ran up to the main level and then out the door to find our class. I would estimate that we were only gone for 20 minutes, and nobody seemed to know that we had left. Our class was over 20 kids, so that was more than the teacher could keep track of. We stayed at the back of the group for the rest of the day, discussing what we saw down there. If there was actually a person living under the school, then we would have to tell someone. Both of us were worried about getting in trouble though, so we wanted a way to do it without admitting anything. In the end, I decided to simply tell the teacher. It was our last week at the school, so what could they do anyway? Suspend us? Our teacher told us that he would check it out, but we didn't find anything out for a while. Days later, we found out that the police had gotten involved. They determined that the setup was probably from a squatter who had snuck into the school through one of the back windows. They thought it hadn't been used in a while, though. They thought whoever it was had moved on. That wouldn't explain the sound we heard down there, though. Jamie and I were pretty sure that we were going to be attacked by some crazy guy who lived under the school, but now they were telling us that he wasn't even there. I don't know what to believe. Maybe it was our imagination, 
but I really think I heard something down there. Either way, we were done with that place and never had to go back. It's creepy to think that for all those years I spent in that school, there was a strange person living just below my feet. In my sophomore year of high school, I was babysitting to make some extra cash. It was a simple enough gig for the most part. This was in 2007, so there were none of the apps like today. To find work, my school had a service where parents would sign up, and then I or someone else would be sent out. One weekend, I was asked to babysit for just one night, on Saturday. The job was for one child, a six-year-old girl. Her dad was a single father, and they lived in a decent-looking suburban house. When I got there, I walked up the path to the front door. Before I could knock or ring the bell, the door swung open. A man stood in front of me, and he must have been the dad. He seemed normal enough and led me into the house. His daughter Kayla was at the kitchen table, working on a coloring book. She looked up for a second to say hi, and then she looked back down. The dad and I talked for another few minutes, and he told me some of the rules for the house. This was all very common, and it was all basic, except for one thing. Right before he left, he told me in no uncertain terms not to go into the basement for any reason. His tone was stern, almost unnerving. I normally wouldn't think too much of something like that, because a lot of people have private areas that they don't want some stranger messing around with. It wasn't what he said, though. It was how he said it. It was like he was scolding me, as if I had already broken the rule. The evening started off pretty normal. I played some games with the little girl and read her some stories. Her bedtime was early, so I read her a final bedtime story and then tucked her in. She fell asleep without a fuss, leaving me alone with the TV in the living room. An hour or so passed, and I was watching a movie on the couch with a can of pop. It was around 9 or 10, and the dad was not expected back until 11.30. Then I heard something, a faint noise coming from the direction of the basement. It sounded like a muffled thump. It was inconsistent, but it came and went a few times each minute. It was too obvious to ignore, so I needed to do something. Maybe it was something important. I worried that somebody was breaking in. My most important job was to protect the little girl, so I decided that I had to check it out. To be honest, I was also a little curious about what was down there. I headed towards the basement door. It was locked, but only with one of those interior door locks that you can open easily with a pen or something. I got it unlocked and pulled the door open. The stairs were carpeted, so I was able to walk down without making any noise. When I got to the bottom, I saw a light coming from under a door at the bottom of the stairs, which struck me as odd. Why would there be a light on in a supposedly off-limits area? The basement was mostly unfinished, with some construction stuff around like they were doing work. The door with the light was the only place that had any walls. The noises were getting louder, and by the time I was on the basement floor, I was pretty sure there was someone down there with me. At the time, I didn't know if it was an intruder, or if there was another person in the house the whole time. I guess an intruder would make more sense, because what would be the point of hiring a babysitter if there was another adult there? I walked to the door where the light was coming from. I turned the knob and opened it. It's when I saw a middle-aged man sitting on a chair staring directly at me. He wasn't tied up or anything, and he didn't look distressed, just sitting there calmly as if he was expecting me. Our eyes met, and a chill ran down my spine. I didn't know him. He wasn't the father of the child, and he clearly wasn't someone I was told to expect. In fact, I think I remember being told that it would just be me and the girl. I ran back up the stairs, slamming the basement door behind me. The man didn't chase me, didn't even move from his chair as far as I could tell. I wanted to leave and run out of that house as fast as I could, but the little girl was asleep upstairs. I couldn't just abandon her, especially if the man was dangerous. I called the police instead, shaking as I dialed the phone. When I told them what happened, they didn't seem to think it was an emergency. They told me they would call the father and get back to me. I stayed there waiting for about 20 minutes, and I saw a police car pull up. At almost the exact same time, the father's car arrived. I looked out the front window as the police and the man talked on the porch. I couldn't tell what they were saying, but at one point, the girl's dad laughed. For some reason, that made me really mad. 
I called the cops to report a potential intruder in his house, where his six-year-old daughter was. How could anything be funny at a time like that? It was bizarre. After a while, the two of them came up to the house. The man unlocked the front door and stepped inside. He flatly denied knowing anything about a man in the basement. Even more frustrating was that he denied telling me not to go down there. He tried to spin it, saying that he told me that I wouldn't want to go down there because it was under construction. The dad allowed the police to search the house, since there was possibly an intruder. They scoured every inch, but found nothing. No man, no signs of forced entry, nothing out of place. The police were skeptical of my story, but I knew what I saw. I couldn't explain it, and didn't know where the man went. Maybe he snuck out one of the windows, that's all I can think of. The dad tried to seem understanding, suggesting that maybe I had fallen asleep and had a nightmare. But I know I hadn't been dreaming. There was a man in that basement, and I can't fathom his purpose or connection to the family. After the police left, the dad thanked me and paid me for the night. But I thought I caught a dark glare from him as he turned away. Maybe I'm reading into it too much, but I felt something was off with that man. I didn't offer to babysit for him again, and I doubt he wanted me either. This happened when I was 10 years old, and my older brother James was 14. We lived in a pretty nice house in a middle class neighborhood, more than big enough for our family of four with a good sized backyard. The main level was the living room, kitchen, and dining room. In the basement, my parents had put together a playroom for the kids. As we got older, we got rid of most of the kids' toys and upgraded to an old TV with a Super Nintendo. Also in the basement was the laundry room, and off of the laundry room, there was the furnace room. It was the only part of the basement that was still unfinished. It was also used for storage, and there were a lot of boxes of junk. It was a cluttered mess. My friends and I would hang out in the playroom, and my brother would have his friends over there too. There was one of my brother's friends who I didn't like. His name was Ben, and my brother had only recently begun hanging out with him. Ben had gotten into trouble a few times that we knew about. He would get suspended from school all the time. There was also a rumor going around that he had robbed a store when he was only 11 years old, but got off because he was so young. I don't know if that was true, but it wouldn't surprise me. I also heard that he beat up his dad pretty badly and was sent to live with his mom. My brother often laughed at Ben's antics as just him being wild, but to me, Ben was someone to steer clear of. I think there's something attractive about being friends with a guy like that when you're young but it often leads to a bad place. One weekend, my parents were out of town, leaving James in charge. Predictably, he invited some friends over to hang out, and they spent most of the evening in the living room watching TV. Since I was the nerdy younger brother, I wasn't allowed to hang out with them, so I was in the basement playing Nintendo on the old TV down there. I was doing one of those annoying water levels in Donkey Kong, and I wanted to finish it so I could get back to one of the fun land levels, at one point, I thought I heard someone coming down the stairs quietly. I was expecting my brother to come in, but that never happened, so I thought it was my imagination. I beat the water level in Donkey Kong, and was back in the jungle. That was when I heard a sound coming from the other room. It sounded like it was coming from the laundry room. It was faint, and barely audible over the game's music, but it was definitely there. Then I heard it again, and realized it was definitely coming from the laundry room. It was like a loud whisper, if that makes any sense. I was curious, so I paused my game, making my way towards the laundry room. When I got there, I reached for the light switch and turned it on, but the room was empty. I looked around and saw the washing machine and dryer to my right. Straight ahead was the open doorway that led to the furnace room. I could see piles of cardboard boxes and darkness beyond that. Then I heard a sound from the furnace room. Within a few seconds, Ben emerged from the shadows. He was holding a kitchen knife in his right hand. It looked like one of the knives from our kitchen, probably the biggest one we had. His eyes were wide and unblinking, and fixed on me, he had a creepy smile on his face. Let's play a game. It wasn't a request, it was a threat. In that moment, every story I had heard about Ben became terrifyingly real. I was alone, nobody would probably hear me if I screamed. My brother and his friends were all the way upstairs, and the TV was loud. I could hear it. Instinct took over. 
I didn't think, I just reacted. With a sharp turn, I bolted, sprinting back towards the basement stairs. I could hear Ben's footsteps behind me. As I made it to the bottom of the stairs, Ben caught up to me. I had made it up three or four steps when I felt him grab my leg and pull me down. I fell hard onto the carpeted floor and almost got the wind knocked out of me. Ben stood over me with a knife, then bent down and ran the blade over my face. I tried to scream, but I was still catching my breath and nothing came out. He then moved to my arm and made a fine cut near my elbow. I looked down and saw that I was bleeding. That moment, I almost passed out. By some miracle, I managed to squirm to my feet and get back up the stairs. I made it to the living room where James and a few others were still watching TV, oblivious to what I had just been through. I burst into the room crying and holding my arm. Blood was dripping down to my fingertips. I yelled out and the older boys turned to me. I told them what Ben had done, but none of them seemed to believe me. I was angry and frustrated, but one question remained. Where was he? James and the others went to look for him. They said he had gone to the bathroom but hadn't come back. James searched the whole house, but he couldn't find Ben anywhere. When he went down to the basement, I waited upstairs. A minute later, James came back upstairs and he was holding a bloody knife, the one that Ben had used to cut me. One of the other guys then said, I knew that guy was crazy. Finally, they believed me. We told my parents when they got home, and they were furious, of course. Ben denied the whole thing, though, and he didn't face any real consequences. James and his friends did stop hanging out with him, though. About a year later, Ben and his mom moved away. It was awkward seeing him around up until then, but once he was gone, I was really happy. A couple years ago, I moved to a new apartment to be closer to work. My old stuff was pretty worn out, so I ditched most of it during the move. That saved me the hassle of having to rent a van, and I was able to do it with just my car. Once I got to my new place, I ordered a bed online, since that was the only thing I really needed immediately. The rest could wait. I had a one-bedroom apartment, so I wanted a couch, a table, and a desk at least. Probably a bed frame eventually, but a mattress on the floor was fine for a while. None of that was urgent though, so I turned to Facebook Marketplace, hoping to find a good deal. The first time I opened it, there was nothing, but I would check every few days. After a week or so, I stumbled upon an ad that seemed like a pretty good find. The guy was selling a few things that I needed, a desk, a table and chairs, and a small couch. No bed frame, but that was the least important thing on my list. The photos looked decent, and the prices were fair. The seller was Matthew, and his profile looked legit. He'd been on Facebook since 2009, and his profile looked real, so I trusted him. He gave me the address, and I told him I would be there later in the week. However, he insisted that it had to be that day. I had plans for later, but it was too good to pass up, so I told him I would be there. My car was pretty small, so I arranged to borrow my friend's SUV, which was a little bigger. It would still probably be at least two trips, though. When I arrived, I saw Matthew, a middle-aged guy with a scruffy beard and long hair. He was waiting for me at the front. He seemed nice enough at first, and offered to help me load the stuff into the car. However, I really needed to use the bathroom. I was embarrassed, but I asked him if I could. He nodded, pointing me down the hall. As I was washing my hands, a faint banging noise caught my attention. It was coming from one of the vents. I leaned in listening, that's when I heard it, a muffled scream, it sounded like somebody was calling for help. My first thought was that this guy had somebody locked in his basement. You know it sounds crazy, but what else could it be? The sound got louder, and then I was sure that it was real. I walked out, trying to keep my cool. The guy was waiting near the front door, eyeing me with a curious look. I felt a nod in my stomach, trying to figure out my next move. Then out of nowhere. He mentioned that he had a horror movie playing in the back room. The explanation was a bit too convenient. We stood there in an awkward silence for a few seconds, each sizing the other up. The sound that I heard was too loud to ignore, and I thought he knew that I was suspicious. As we stood there, I heard it again, but tried to pretend that I didn't notice. I could tell that he was suspicious. His next excuse was even more bizarre. He said that his wife was in the basement playing a joke. 
That was my cue to leave. I ran for the car, not even bothering to take the furniture. It didn't look like he was following me as I got out of that neighborhood. Once I was a good distance away, I called the police, explaining everything, from the Facebook ad to the strange noises in the vent. They told me that they'd check it out and asked me to stay on the line. I pulled over and parked at a nearby shopping mall, ready to help if the cops needed me. As I later found out, the police arrived at the house, and when they rang the doorbell, nobody answered. Just like me, they heard the screams, so that gave them the cause to search the house. They broke a window and went in. What they found was shocking. Matthew was nowhere to be found, but when they made their way to the basement, they found where the screams were coming from. They were coming from a young woman who had been locked in a room in the basement. Turned out that Matthew didn't own the house or the items that he was trying to sell. They belonged to the woman in the basement. Matthew was robbing her. For some inexplicable reason, Matthew actually used his real Facebook account for posting, and Matthew was even his real name. Because of that, the police had no trouble tracking him down. After the encounter with me, he must have taken off but didn't get very far. They caught him later that day. I can only imagine the terror that woman must have felt being trapped down there. When she heard us talking upstairs, she must have decided to make some noise. It couldn't have come at a better time, because I was only in that house for a few minutes. I don't know what he would have done to her otherwise. I hope he would have let her go, but that's far from certain. <laughs>